Okay, welcome back to Mining Now. We are on episode four, live from CIMBC 22. And we have a part two guest coming on the show, which is a lot of fun. We have a few of those episodes. Um, we've got Derek Kerr on. He is the market director for mining at General Kinematics. And we are going to be discussing some of their projects um, and, and actually walking through them, but also looking at sort of the customer perspective um, who has provided feedback for some of their products. So, Derek, welcome to the show. Good to have you on. Thank you very much. It's actually our first interview together because you were on with Rory the first episode. Correct, correct. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to make this personal right off the, off the bat. You've been with the company for, I, on LinkedIn it says 43 years, I think. 45 years and 10 months. So I think it's safe to say you actually do like the company you work with. Is that a fair... <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a fair assumption. Yes, <laughs> um, but 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 tell me why that that's a that is a long time uh, to be with a company and an organization. Um, I, I guess what is I'm I'm sure opportunities have come up over those those years. What what is it about the company? Uh, it's a family owned company. It's on the third generation, so I, I've known all three generations so far. I started with the grandfather, the father, and now the son, and. Uh, it's always been a pleasure working there. There's a lot of variety. It's very good, uh, changing things from time to time. And I started in engineering and then moved into sales after about 30 years of engineering. But uh, I've always enjoyed it. I've always enjoyed the variety and the type of equipment that we build, and it's fun. Was it, uh, and I did see that because I was looking on your LinkedIn while I was preparing yesterday, that transition from that when you're in engineering, I mean, sales is obviously very different, but because you had so much technical background, was it a fairly easy transition or, or was there challenges? Oh, it was a very easy transition. Probably 90, 95% of our sales force came from engineering. Oh, okay. And so we rely on that knowledge that uh, we're not selling from a catalog. Right. We, we are pretty much custom engineered equipment. We do have some standard equipment but uh, we are customized engineering so that we fit into any kind of footprint and it, that engineering backgrounds helped greatly with that. So are you, yeah, because I was looking at it, we'll, we'll get into some of those, I, I, I noticed that you're, you're not necessarily, I'm, I'm sure you do lots of that as well, but not all your products are coming in when the mine is actually first built. Sometimes you're getting plugged into a system. Uh, correct, actually a lot of times we're replacing somebody else. Yeah. And so we call it Brownfield. Uh, we're actually pulling their equipment out, putting ours in, and we have to try and fit into the exact same footprint wherever possible so that there's the least amount of downtime, least amount of changes, modifications, and they can just turn one off, plug us in, turn us on. Is that, um, it would, I mean, not, not exact numbers, would that, is that half the business? I mean, you must do a lot of, like, first first development as well. Sure, sure. Uh, for mining, I'd say probably a probably about 60 plus percent of the applications are replacing something else. Now let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. First up, we have Savannah Equipment. Savannah Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. Visit them at savannahequipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. Next up, we have OptiSize. OptiSize is a leading edge geophysical acquisition design and software company. OptiSize provides innovative seismic survey designs utilizing the latest field technology and optimizing for advanced processing and quantitative interpretation techniques. OptiSize's mission is to bring sustainable exploration sol solutions to energy development with their custom land footprint reduction technology, EcoSize. EcoSize enables operators to focus on reducing their environmental and greenhouse gas footprint while imaging all their su subsurface targets and reducing costs. You can visit them at OptiSize.com to learn more. Next up, we have Apex Automation. Looking to solve a problem, Apex Automation has a solution. Their proven track record has helped organizations streamline production and improve team morale by removing mundane tasks and lowering operation costs and burdens. Robotics, advanced process control, and machine learning are examples of what Apex Automation can provide. Have an idea and looking for a trusted consultant who can deliver? Contact Apex Automation today and start your team's automation journey. Visit them at apexautomation.ca to learn more. 
Next up, we have Fenner Dunlop. Fenner Dunlop Asflex belts are engineered to withstand the harshest applications, delivering benefits that solve customer problems via superior rip, tear, and impact resistance. Asflex are extremely strong and robust belts that are difficult to destroy, which is important for heavy-duty bulk material handling environments. Made in their very own North American manufacturing facilities, this revolutionary concept in straight warp conveyor belting is up to three times more impact resistant versus competitor belting. Asflex users use fewer belts per year, make fewer belt repair and replacements, reduce or eliminate belt downtime, and improve employee safety. Visit FennerDunlopAmericas.com to learn more about their premium Asflex conveyor belting. Last but not least, we have Fuller Brothers. Fuller Brothers Inc. has over 59 years of tire industry experience as the world's leader in providing non-hazardous, non-toxic products that reduce tire management costs for a diverse range of customers. The acknowledged formula developers of the globally recognized tire life. Fuller Brothers also produces other quality products such as PSF Plus, PSF Lubes It, Tire Cream, Dripless Tire Paint, Omega Tire Repair System, as well as select tire service tools and tire painting equipment. For more information, you can visit them at fullerbros.com or by calling toll-free at 1-800-547-7785. Fuller Brothers, we have the inside covered. Now let's get back to the interview. Um, I kind of want to jump in quite quickly into some of your, your products line. I saw quite a bit, and then I, uh, there, I actually got sent a PDF as well. It's called the STM Screen. Um, and it's, I'm not a screening expert, to be honest. So I just wanted to, I saw a thing, it's, it's uh, STM Screen compared to Brute Force. Can you just quickly distinguish what the difference is between them? And then we'll go into actually why the STM is, is such a, a high-value product. Okay, brute force is the, I'm going to call it the industry standard. Okay. That's what the huge majority of people have out there currently. And brute force is where the drive mechanism that powers the unit that makes it vibrate is actually attached directly to the carrying surface that the material conveys on. Okay. Two mass is a little bit different. There's actually a secondary mass where your drive system is attached to a secondary mass and then there's a, a bank of springs that are between the first mass and the second mass. And it creates a natural frequency. And so it operates very differently than a brute force machine does. It, it actually is very load responsive in a positive manner instead of a negative manner like a brute force machine is. So if that would, right away what kind of comes to my mind then, is that, so would a two mass system then uh, be less, um, a, a, essentially less breakdown prone or, or less wear prone then? It's all of the above. It's uh, much less breakdown prone, and that's because of the, the wheels that are on a, a two-mass machine that power or drive the system are much, much smaller in size. Whereas in a brute forest, they're huge offset eccentric weights that are on there. So the majority of breakdowns that are caused on a machine are at startup and shutdown. Ironically, mm. it's not during operation. It's when you actually turn on and off the machine. Oh, I see. And a brute force machine will actually go through, I'm going to call it twists and turns, where as these big, huge wheels are trying to slow down, the whole machine starts to rack and twist. And that will actually cause cracks and failures in the machine. Whereas a two-mass machine has very small wheels, and you can literally stop them cold. Something I'm always interested, so d did, did General Kinematics launch this into the industry? Is this something that had been around a long time? What's sort of the story behind it becoming? It's, it, the technology's been around for a real long time. Our, 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 the grandfather that started our company, uh, Albert Michute, he was very instrumental in helping it grow. He started that back in the, in the 50s when he first became an employee. At, at companies, and he's been involved with, geez, a hundred and some odd patents wow. involved in that in that type of technology. But he was a brilliant man, came from MIT, and he uh, helped make two mass what it is today. Mm. And it uh, so it, it's been around a great deal of time. We've been in operation since 1960, is when our company started, and we've been doing it since our inception. And he helped bring it along further and further. 
So will you will you make a brute force one, or you won't even make them? We make both. You make both. Oh, okay. So we what would what machines. would the application would be where a brute force would be a good choice, and then the other? Well, a, a brute force machine is very simplistic, very simple, very easy to do. Uh, it you're going to use it typically for lighter load applications. I see. And where material isn't sticky or blinding or tends to uh, plug up the deck. Whereas a two mask can actually react to that kind of a situation, a brute force will not. It'll, it'll react in a negative manner. It'll actually lose stroke until it literally stops. So now when you're, you're coming in, uh, now do clients know that that's what they need? Or like, do you, are, when, you're repl- when you're replacing a unit, in the brownfield, what are you, are you replacing a, a two mass, a, for lack of a better, a bad version of a two mass, or are you pr- replacing a brute force? Typically a brute force. Okay. You know, that's, like I say, that's 90 plus percent of what you see out there currently. Is and it it's, really? It's been around for much, much longer than two mass has been around. It's very simplistic, very easy to design. I, I hate to use those kind of terms, but it is. Yeah. It, uh, there's very little involved with uh, being able to do it. You could pick up a book and build one tomorrow. You know, it's that simple. And uh, so that's what the industry was built on. The bad thing is that the industry got accustomed to that, and they got accustomed to these failures that the machines go through, and they, they live with it. Mm-hmm. They didn't think there was anything else out there. Right. And so they, they deal with uh, something that, in our mind, is a premature failure of the machine. Right, yeah. Now, do they do, do people know about it now? I mean, obviously, you know, you're coming on the show and you want to talk about it, um, so you want more people to. But is does the industry know about it, or are people sitting there with their, <laughs> their, the old, mach- or their old machines and knowing that it's wrong, but just haven't sort of made that investment? Or do they actually not know about the two-mass system? A lot of it they don't know. You know, it's something new. It's something fresh, different to them. You know, they say, oh, wow, it's new technology. It's not new technology. It's been around a real long time. It's just it's new to them. Right. So. Like, when you're talking, um, so I, I wanted to talk about this Mount, uh, Mountain Copper uh, project um, because you did this. There's a good video. We're actually going to play the video here in a sec just to sort of show it. Um, that, when you say it's, it's mostly customized. Is there is there a template that you're following? Like, what is customized about this one for Copper Mountain as opposed to another one? Is it is it size or is it actual parts? What what is it? This one had to be a physical size to to be able to to match what the existing screen was. It had a certain level of uh, inclination. The machine only went downhill roughly three degrees. Okay. So they we had to match that. And that was because there was only so much room available. And then where the, the equipment mounted to its existing foundation, we had to mount, match that as well. So they could literally pull theirs out and put ours right on the same mounting pads. Oh, I see. So I'm, I'm, I've been asking people different versions of this question. I'm always curious. Um, like Something like this Copper Mountain project, how does that, how does that stop conversation, how does that first content contact get made and you know we need to replace we have a problem like that whole conversation how does that start where does it start well that actually started here ironically at okay. CM. <laughs> so that was roughly four years ago or so yeah uh actually i did a seminar at mm. that cim and i cannot remember for the life of me if it was somebody was in that seminar but later on that day somebody approached our booth and was questioning and asking about it and it and it grew it grew from that, and they were willing to take a, a chance. I don't want to say it that way, but it, uh, they, they wanted to do something different. What yeah. they had wasn't working, and so they, they looked at ours, and they studied it, and uh, they liked what they saw, and we basically sold it to them all on a maintenance budget. So what they were currently spending in maintenance dollars wow. is what the equipment, and in a period of it, one year, paid for the equipment really just on their maintenance budget and is that because of the uh actually you know what before we go i want to play this video because there's um so we're going to pause for a second we're going to bring up that video because i want the audience to sort of see real customer feedback and then we'll jump back into the interview
Looking to increase their capacity, the technical team at Copper Mountain Mining Corporation sought a solution. Daily conversations focused towards screening, and they knew they could achieve better results with the right equipment. Eventually, their search led them to General Kinematics STM screen. Since installation, the screen has performed to what we expected and then exceeded a bit of our expectations. Um, the best way of putting that is it's not a problem. It's not something we talk about every day now. Our previous uh, screening capabilities were, were quite challenged and we've come to a point now where when we're talking about restrictions and we're talking about mechanical electrical issues, the, the screen is just not a unit operation that is in our day-to-day -day lives. All in all, we've gone from a maintenance interval of requiring us to take the deck and fully rebuild it every three months. We've now extended that out to two years of running with no major issues. Copper Mountain Mining Company, located in British Columbia, Canada, operates at 40,000 tons per day, producing copper concentrate. With an operation this big, mill maintenance superintendent Dave Keyworth knows how critical this is to his team's performance. It's allowed me to, to move people to get more PMs done, like before we spent a lot of time doing rebuilds and breakdowns. So now I can do more preventative maintenance on other equipment. So that, that's probably the biggest uh, benefit that I've seen for sure. The reclaimed time was not only a benefit for the maintenance staff, but the process also got a boost. One of the challenges we had with the old screen deck was that uh, we were challenged with as we had overload issues, um, the screening efficiency would decrease, ultimately lead to um, poor screening, increased recirculating load, and ultimately a loss in production. The improvement in screening allowed the team to not only decrease the recirculating load, but have confidence that the screen would perform. For Mike Westendorf, Director of Metallurgy, the two-mass design of the STM screen simplified their process and allowed them to get back to delivering value. So the screen's done a, an overall positive impact to our operation. It's allowed us to achieve a higher throughput and it has significantly reduced our operating costs. CMMC is proof that mines can increase screening reliability, capacity, and efficiency with General Kinematics STM screen. So I, I think the first one that stood out for me was uh, Jamie said in that video, he said, um, we went from talking about it every day, and I, I think we've all been in that, those, uh, any type of business environment or operational environment where the, the pebble in the shoe is just, it's just <laughs> circulating through the whole place. And it's just like you walk into a room, oh, well, this is coming up again. <laughs> um, so I know what he's talking, I know exactly what he's talking about when he said that. But they, they went to, no to not thinking about it. Correct. And is that, it, I mean, it, it almost seems too simple, but is that the difference between <laughs> the, the two items? Well, yeah, that they, were, they were having a maintenance nightmare with the other unit that they had in there. And it was every six to eight weeks, they were having massive That's failures and they would have to replace the unit. So at a, at a time frame, about every two months, they had to pull a unit out, put a new one in. And they were actually making a new one on the side from that day, waiting for this one to fail. Really? So they could replace was it. it was, was there a lot of, because you said the start and stop, so were they, they weren't running continuously then? So they must have been. Like, I don't think every, every plant starts and stops from point to point. You know, right. it doesn't take a great deal to cause failure in a machine like that. Right. It, it's not like they, they're doing it hundreds of times a day. It, it's a matter of doing it just a couple of times a day. Right. It might make a big difference in that machine. And, I mean, and then the other thing, though, and this is what I didn't quite, and I wanted to actually kind of unpack this on here. He said, um, I think it was Dave said, uh, no, no, no. It was Jamie again. The overload issues, the overload overload issues and the screening efficiency would decrease, leading to poor screening and recirculation. Can you, on, from a technical level, explain what, so there, it's not just the stopping and starting that was a problem. There was actually an efficiency issue as well, it seemed. Correct. Can you unpack that The overloading that and efficiency. The overloading, uh, the, their machine there is, is fed by a sag mill. Right. And so 
sag mills every now and then have upsets or where they'll actually spit out uh, a, a overload of material or over capacity what the machine was actually designed for. And every machine needs to be able to accept that at some point in time. And theirs happens from time to time, just like every, every facility out there. Well, the existing machine, in their case, would actually get buried, and it would literally stop the machine. Well, And since they've put our machine in, they've had those same upsets and, and, and issues with the sag mill where it still spits out that overload, but it's never shut us down one single time. And what is that, and why is that, though? It's because the two masses gives it a positive response to material load. On a brute force, as you add material to it, the stroke goes down, down, down. It gets lower oh. and lower until it literally stops. The motor will be spinning, but the machine's not moving. Oh, I see. oh right, right, because of that two-mass system. The two-mass can actually, it'll actually react because it's a frequency change right. that is occurring. So as you add material to it, the, the actual ampli amplitude of the machine tries to go up. Right. And so it'll actually handle that surge of material easily. And uh, we actually control that through a VFD, a variable frequency drive. Okay. So that we do not allow it to go in excess. We want the stroke to be in a positive direction, but we, we, we also want to limit how high it goes. Yeah, and then they, uh, what did they say? Two years without an issue. Yeah, it's coming up on three now. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I when I saw that, what I was thinking is there must have been someone in charge that was thinking, are you kidding me? All these headaches. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we needed. Yeah. Yeah, actually, come the end of June, we'll be three years. That's amazing. Um, yeah, and you know what? I, I think these technical discussions, obviously, I mean, I'm biased, but we're doing them here. Um, but I've gone to some of these. I mean... It's worth checking out some of these uh, these technical discussions at these events. Like I was, we had Rogers on earlier, and they're out here scouring here, looking for ideas and trying to understand the industry better and how to communicate because there's so much knowledge, and it's almost like a case of you don't know what you don't know, right? You're you're walking <laughs> around thinking, well, this is what we use, this is what we've done. So right. you're trying to make a bad issue more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, very true. Um, can we talk a little bit about the lab testing? Um, I sure. saw that. Um, can, I, I don't, I don't, so you, are you setting up small operations or, I, I'm not going to assume I know. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's that about? You're, you're good not assuming that because it's, uh, it's actually a downscaled version where instead of, in the industry, most of the units we're supplying are 10, 12, 14, 16 feet wide. Okay. We actually have a system set up in our factory that is one foot wide. Oh. So we're actually taking and downscaling the capacity of the equipment to be the same bed depth of material on one foot as if it was on 8 or 10 or 12 feet. Right. And we're actually running the material at different points, and we get good ideas to where the separation of, of that material so is. So uh, you're talking about a customer's material or Correct. type of material. Yeah, Yeah, we've run gold through our facility. We've run iron ore, copper. We've run all sorts of different types of material. And we can do it in a wet application or a dry application, mm -hmm. either one. And so it gives us real, it gives us a real good point to, to know exactly how big the equipment needs to be. And it also has shown us to we know that our technology will outperform mm -hmm. the other technology because we've run both. Right. And we can see the differences, and it's, it's substantial, and a lot of it applies to that stroke change. Because the brute force goes down, you can add one pound of material, and it can affect the stroke in a negative manner on a brute force. Right. It'll be so small you wouldn't see it, but the more and more and more you add, the more it's affected in a negative manner. Right. So when we set it up in our factory, we can set it up to react both ways, and it gives us the ability to handle 30 to 40 percent more material in the exact same size unit. Is this, I mean, again, is this one of those things, do people, do people know about it, or, or do you get a lot of requests, just people trying to get a sense? I mean, that must be a pre-sale thing that happens a lot, just to find, is this the right solution for us? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the industry doesn't know about it yet. That's the word we're trying to get out yeah. to people. We can prove it to them with the, with the factory uh, testing, and we can show them that we can actually achieve these goals so that it's not just something that they think we're making yeah. up. 
or some, some kind of sales mumbo jumbo. Right, yeah. It's uh, it's real. Just before we wrap up the interview, um, again, because you're, I mean, you've been with your company for so long. What are what are the challenges? And and I always appreciate it when when companies can come on and talk about those as well, because we all know there's challenges in all of our businesses. What what are the what are the challenges you run into, whether it's sort of communication or trying to find sort of the right fit and, and you know, piecing something into someone else's operation? What, what's sort of the main, the main challenge you run into or have run into over the years that maybe you've solved in the last few years? Oh, fitting into the footprint is very easy for that's us to easy. do. You know, that's something that we don't have a problem. We've got a great staff of engineers on site. And then we have also the salespeople are as well, engineers. And... Uh, it's that's the least of our worries. The the biggest problem is getting people to believe that you can do what you say you can do. Right. I mean that's the the biggest bottleneck that we run into. Yeah. Is it um, how much of an advantage do do you think someone who doesn't have an engineering uh, background could do sales? I'm not applying for a job or anything. I, I promise. But it. Could, could you could you sell without it, or is it that technical and, and just building that trust? Do you need, I mean, they're not looking for a great salesperson if you're going to a mine operator. You're looking for that technical. Could anybody sell it without that background? You know, everybody could sell. It, it's uh, it's going to take a lot better of a salesperson, I yeah. believe, if he's strictly sales. Uh, the engineering in, in this industry, people want to talk to somebody that knows a lot about yeah. the equipment. And uh, if it's catalog sales, no, they, they don't want to talk to a catalog salesman. Right. They want to talk to somebody that knows something about the equipment, how it runs, how it works, how it operates. What did you, but going back to when you transitioned, though, what did you, what did you find different? You said it was an easy transition, but what did you find? I'm sure as an engineer, you still were dealing sometimes with customers. What, what, what were the, some of the differences that you ran into? You know, for day one, you're now the guy that's got to get the transaction done. Yeah. To be honest, the biggest thing for me was doing things like this. Right. <laughs> being in front of a crowd, being in front of people, yeah. you know, that you don't don't know. I yeah. mean, that was that was tough. I mean, I I can tell you some stories where I was very nervous about being around people. Now it's much more simplistic. <laughs> simplistic. Has it gotten fun yet, though? <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean we we've, we've got a chance to work. I mean you've worked mo mostly with Rory. Your team has, um, but it's just been a pleasure work work with your team, and it, it's it's nice to have you live at a show. I mean there's something about being here at an event, actually doing these interviews. It's just sort of an extra little bit fun rather than stuck in a studio. So <laughs> so thanks for coming out. Uh, it, it's been great to have you on the show. Thank you. Okay. That is, uh, we're ra we've wrapped up another episode. Uh, please keep watching. Please keep suggesting guests. And, uh, and obviously, follow General Kinematics. We'll have uh, plenty of links. It'll be easy to access. We'll lots of pictures and videos for you to sort of go through the technical information. We'll have some, we'll have some links as well um, to what I was referencing during the show. In the bottom, we'll have some of those PDFs. You can actually download those, those papers, and they're, they're quite... Uh, they're, they're quite uh, intricate details on them and things like that. So thank you, everybody. See you on the next episode of Mining Now.